Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Martin. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and talk about some of the interesting research we've been doing, or hopefully interesting research we've been doing. Um, I'm running the HexHive, or I'm leading the HexHive Research Lab, and we are focusing on vulnerabilities. And our goal is to get rid of as many vulnerabilities as possible before code is actually being shipped. But given that the techniques that we are working on are incomplete, there's inevitantly going to be vulnerabilities that are hitting the users, and there we're trying to minimize the impact as much as possible. One of the facts that we are facing is that software has bugs. This is just an axiom that we can use and assume. And interestingly, many of the bugs in these uh, large and widespread softwares are still memory safety vulnerabilities, as in these are low-level bugs that allow you to corrupt certain program state. Right? So they have an impact that when these bugs are actually triggered, they would compromise the integrity of the underlying software system and enable attackers to gain some unwan unwanted privileges on top of it. And just recently, Microsoft announced a larger study where they showed that at least 70% um, of all the security bugs are due to these low-level memory safety issues. But uh, they are pretty much everywhere, right? They can be in the Linux kernel. Uh, they can be in user land, they can be on top of your, your browser, in your operating system, or anywhere in between. And one of the issues that we are facing, you're not supposed to read the text in detail here. Just, uh, I just want to highlight this number up there. Uh, open bugs, 945. And these are crashes that are currently open, as of uh, last week, on the Linux kernel. All of these crashes would allow an attacker to compromise your Chrome tablet, your Android system, or any other Linux system that is out there if they gain, uh, gain access to, to them. Right? So this is a large amount of open issues that are currently unfixed. And we need to develop better strategies to figure out which one of the, those 945 bugs actually need to be fixed quickly because they're the most important ones. So what we conclude here is that there's bugs, and bugs are everywhere. Now we need to figure out which bugs to focus on, how to focus on them, and how to select the, the different targets. As I said, many of these bugs are actually exploitable, right? And exploitable can mean many different things. Um, on these systems, if the integrity is compromised, this could be used to simply take over your system, run attacker-controlled code on it, to, for example, encrypt your hard drive and ask for a ransom, to take over your cloud instances and run arbitrary code on it, or attack other cloud instances on the site, which is still a little bit abstract. But as soon as we move into the IoT domain, things are starting to get a bit more physical and tangible. Um, while it may be fun for an attacker to exploit your, your car, if you're sitting in your smart car and it suddenly turned into a remotely controlled toy vehicle, it may not be as much fun for you. An attacker may gain access to your physical space by compromising your smart lock or turn your camera that you used for, for security into something that deeply will invade your privacy. And these are all things that we need to fix. One of the issues that we are facing, we've heard in previous talks a bit about the formal verification, analysis, and so on. One of the issues that we are facing on, uh, on this end, the, on the software that I'm looking at, is that software is incredibly complex. If you look at Google Chrome, one of the most common browsers out there, just the system itself has, set, has 76 million lines of code. Your visual graphical user interface runtime system adds another 20, 25 million lines of code to it. Uh, together with the kernel, another 70 million lines of code. This is a massive amount of complexity. Now, I'm telling you these really, really large numbers. For me, this was really hard to imagine what does this complexity actually mean. And let me give you an example. Right? Um, I love showing this picture. This is Margaret Hamilton, who wrote the code for the, or was, was leading the team who was writing the code for the Apollo guidance computer. And um, she stands next to a printed out stack of all the code that was running on the system. And this was written in assembly, very low level, so it was very low density of, uh, of code. And let's be generous, this is about two meters of complexity right, that we have here. Now, if you print out the Google Chrome um, source code on A4 
uh, 17, uh, 27 lines per page, you end up with a stack of complexity of roughly 400 meters. This is crazy. And we are seeing exponential growth. Right? So code is growing faster than we can, uh, we can protect it and we can analyze it. So we have to develop techniques that actually can cope with this massive amount of scale and very high density of information. So let me quickly introduce some of the research question that we are looking at and then actually try to give you some, some answers or at least intuition of what we are looking at. Well, um, ideally, we want to focus on these five questions that somewhat interact with each other. Uh, an important aspect is that we find tools and approaches and mechanisms that allow us to effectively detect security violations. Um, you don't need to understand the code, but one of the aspects here is that we are replacing part of the code with checks that would tell the system that if this is being executed, it would trigger a runtime fault and would allow us to infer that, hey, something has gone wrong. This is an example that is happening right here. We need to fix this. We want to develop mechanisms that automatically generate test cases. Right? I just told you that we develop systems that detect when something goes wrong, but we first need to execute it to figure out if it can go wrong. Therefore, we need to create reasonable test cases that actually execute this code. We need to scale to hundreds or thousands of, of files, millions of lines of code, massive complexity. We may even work, have to work across the hardware interface. So one of the recent software testing projects that we worked on where we found a large amount of vulnerabilities was targeting USB uh, interfaces. So you could walk up to a computer, plug in an arbitrary USB device, and gain code execution and full control over the system just by exploiting bugs in the stack of how the operating system handled the, the USB interface, which hasn't been tested before. Right? Now that we have tested all these different interfaces and aspects, we can use all the information that we have from our tests to then develop customized mitigations that when this code is being shipped, as we will evidently miss some kind of bugs due to our tests, that we can have an, like a, a stopgap measure of last resort for any remaining bugs to detect them in a customized manner. So in my group, we're working in three different directions. And while I'm here happily talking about some of the recent research, the majority of, or actually all of the credit of actually implementing and designing large part of these systems goes to the students who put in all the hard work uh, into working on all these systems and developing these aspects. So the three areas we are working on is software testing, mitigation, and compartments. For software testing, this is a, a technique that is done before we ship code to the, uh, to the customer. This is uh, what the developer should be doing. The goal is to, to prune bugs, and here we need to help developer find and get rid of as many of the bugs as possible. And we're leveraging fuzzing and sanitization, words that have been mentioned before, uh, to actually accomplish this. Uh, as a second step, mitigation. The goal is to stop exploitation of any remaining bugs in there. So it's like a, a last line of defense, a last measure. This is actually running on the, uh, on the user's, uh, user's end, right? When you're browsing the internet using your, your favorite browser, there's a large set of mitigations that are in place that if a bug is being triggered, it is hopefully being detected by these mitigations and stopped. And you can think of this as a, as a bouncer that stops you from entering the, the club or whatever. Last but not least, the question of complexity um, needs to be worked on uh, as well. And we are looking at compartment, uh, compartments and compartmentalization mechanisms to break this massive amount of complexity into smaller chunks that can actually be handled in an efficient manner. Today, I will talk to you about two aspects, uh, and I will start with some of the software testing approaches. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about fuzzing, but let me go a little bit deeper in that and explain you what fuzzing actually is. Uh, quick show of hands, did anybody work with fuzzing before, write a fuzzer, fuzz any kind of software? Okay, I would say about 3 to 4 percent. Uh, that's actually not bad, uh, that's surprisingly good. So fuzzing is a random testing technique. Let's say we are given a, a binary, an executable, like this, this binary up there, um, and we want to figure out if it has any bugs. 
right? A simple approach is we just run it in a contained system, obviously, and then it tells us, yeah, use it, test me, and you give me a 32-bit integer as an argument. So far, so good. We give it some random input string and see what happens, and then it tells us, oh, please enter an integer. Now, how can we automate this? Well, let's write a simple fuzzer, and I don't know how, how well your shell scripting is, so I'll quickly go through that. Forever, repeat forever, or we run out of, uh, out of cycles. Um, create some random input by creating a random number of four bytes. Then run this, this, this target program as the input, and if anything happens, as in it crashes or something goes wrong, we store this in the set of, uh, of crashing seats. Done, right? We, we let this run, and then we see what happens. Um, as of July 2022, Google is running uh, fuzzing test suites uh, on a very large scale on tens of thousands of CPUs, and they are targeting a lot of open source software. Their OSS fuzz efforts have found uh, over 40,000 bugs and 650 open source projects. This is a large amount of, of bugs, so this is surprisingly effective. Uh, we'll talk in a bit about how to make this very simple technique a bit more clever. Right? And from a developer's perspective, it's amazing. It takes about, as a developer, it takes you about five minutes to configure a fuzzer, to run it, and to find crashes in your software. So if you are a software developer or any kind of software developer, you should be using fuzzing for your software. If, if this is the only thing that you take from this talk, fuzz your software and find as many bugs as possible. If you're a researcher, there's a lot of interesting aspects in there on how to make fuzzing more efficient and more effective. And we can talk more about those in, in 101s. If you break down a fuzzer, like this, this simple script, into a couple of different components, we can highlight where we can actually create uh, improvements. On one hand, a fuzzer needs to have some input, right? So we can work on better mechanisms to create more structured, more aligned, better organized inputs to actually run the program. When running the program, the fuzzer needs to detect if a crash has happened. So we can develop different kind of better sanitizers, better, uh, better optimization mechanisms, more efficient uh, execution mechanisms. And this process runs forever, or we run out of cycles. We are sampling a near infinite state space, so we never know when we are done. So usually we just assign fuzzing a finite amount of samples and then hope to find as many bugs as possible, and then make fuzzing or tune fuzzing as good as possible. Now, one important aspect that has actually improved fuzzing a lot is coverage, and we've heard coverage before, right? So we're trying to keep track of which parts of the program we have executed, where the hard parts of the program are, and then use some feedback mechanism to optimize the input generation mechanism to then uh, create better inputs for, for these areas. Now, how do we make fuzzing effi efficient or effective? Well, you can make fuzzing effective in three easy steps. First of all, the test cases that we are generating must actually trigger bugs. And coverage is a great start, uh, but what we've recently been looking at more and more is state awareness and uh, awareness of individual variables. We've got an interesting paper coming up at FSE where we show that uh, variable interactions are, are actually highly important to infer efficient test cases. And uh, I just noticed today that this one actually won a Distinguished Paper Award. Um, Different kind of exploration strategies that are targeted towards individual niches are equally important. So, for example, if you're working on, on Bluetooth fuzzing, you may want to optimize towards a, a system that is following or, or partially aware of the Bluetooth protocol, so actually fitting the niche with some customization. Second, the fuzzer must be able to detect bugs. We are working on different kind of sanitization mechanisms to trigger bugs that go beyond memory safety violations, but also to make the detection of memory safety violations um, easier and, and more performant. Last but not least, an interesting aspect in fuzzing is that performance is key. Like, there, there's a zero-sum game. You have a finite amount of time, you have a finite amount of resources you may have a little bit of developer time to customize the fuzzing process before you start, and then you can adjust it a little bit as you go along. But from your compute resources, you've got a finite amount of resources. 
any cycle that your computer executes, that you spend on, on executing the target program, you will not be spending on creating better inputs. Or any cycle you spend on creating better inputs, you will not be spending on analyzing constraints to reach these inputs. So you have to carefully optimize and tune what the best kind of uh, alignment is for these, uh, for these different systems. If you, want to know, if you want to know more about fuzzing, Check out some of our recent papers, but also hit me up and just ask me any questions afterwards. We've talked about software testing. This is just like a small glimpse of, uh, of this area. I'm not going to talk about mitigation today. It's still an interesting topic, but I want to spend a couple of minutes on, uh, to talk about compartments and compartmentalization, because I personally believe that this is going to be an important step for us uh, at any layer of abstraction to enforce stronger security guarantees, because we can break these large comp complex systems into smaller compartments, ensure protection and interactions between compartments, but also on the architecture side to develop different kind of ISA extensions, on the policy side to create better policies how these systems should interact with each other, or on the programming languages side, how to actually fit these, uh, these aspects into uh, new and modern programming languages. Now again, this may be hard for you to imagine, so let me start with an illustrative example. Right? Compartmentalization enables privilege separation and allows us to break large complex systems into smaller parts. If we go back 60, 70 years, uh, a work environment looked a little bit like this. Right? So there was a large open area, a bunch of desks, no separation whatsoever. Right? People could walk from one desk to another desk without being interrupted, could look at what this other person was working on. There was really no, no secrecy or privacy among the different compartments, even though all these workers were working on potentially different tasks. We then moved into having some kind of a notion of compartmentalization by adding like little bounding boxes between people. This can work to some extent, but it doesn't give you strong guarantees. Ideally, we'll work into an environment, we'll move into an environment where there are doors that can be closed, but there's also an interaction and a policy on how we can actually interact with different, uh, different other compartments. And this would be, be the, the personal office scenario that also op uh, allows an open door policy. Now, to make this a little bit more concrete again from, uh, from this example, to, a, to an actual system, we looked at compartmentalization opportunities for the Linux kernel, and we manually implemented compartmentalization policies for different kind of kernel modules and focusing on the, on the network stack, breaking this into smaller components and actually demonstrating that high performance uh, compartmentalization is possible in complex software systems. This involved a lot of manual efforts. And uh, the student was working on the, on the actual implementation of this policy for several months, rewriting large amounts of kernel code. So it serves as a nice demonstration that it's possible, but it comes at a cost. So maybe looking at more convenient mechanisms or automatic mechanisms to enforce these policies and not just working on the mechanism will be interesting going forward. We've also looked at this from a, from a language perspective. And maybe you are, for some of you who are Go programmers, we had a Go backend, but also a, a Python backend for this. And here we looked at, uh, at the issue that writing these policies is extremely complicated. And we uh, presented enclosures, which provides a, a language level enclosure to dynamically scope memory views. So think of it as in a, in a large program that you're writing, you have small parts of code where you give access to just a certain amount of data. Um, so if you want to zoom in on the important part here, uh, so this is with secrets read. So you are, we, are, we are giving read access to, this, to the secret variable. No system call functions. We are executing this other function here. So this allows us to execute a certain function and a library call with a very limited memory view and a very small access to the, to the memory space. This enables very strong and efficient compartmentalization at very low um, performance overhead. We've got several other projects in compartmentalization going on. Hopefully, you will see them near you 
in a, in a programming language or in architecture if you manage to get this in. And uh, there's definitely a lot of interesting research projects happening there. I want to give a quick shout out to uh, the sponsors that, uh, that actually enable a lot of this research. And without them, it would not be possible to actually get the, uh, the, the funding to work on that many diverse, uh, diverse projects. Let me conclude and hopefully have you excited to join the uh, Software Security Fund right Fun right, and help us harvest as many bugs as possible. Bugs are ubiquitous, and as programmers are writing new code, they are an inherently regrowing uh, resource and fastly growing resource in that case. Software testing enables us to weed them out early and get rid of as many bugs as possible before we actually ship code. Mitigations are a last line of defense and help us protect uh, people against attacks. And compartmentalization will then allow us to limit their, their impact. In the future, and uh, partially now, our research will focus on specialization to new environments. How can we better protect IoT systems? How can we better protect server systems? How can we interact with hardware? Uh, similarly, we also want to enable developers to better understand bugs and give them a way to rank bugs. There's going to be an interesting paper coming up at uh, CCS in a month for that. Uh, we want to customize mitigations per program and also work on the compartmentalization side to have strong and efficient mechanism and automatic policy inference. I hope this was uh, exciting for you and you're as excited as me about these security aspects. Uh, this concludes my talk and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.